Dear friends, I am very pleased to be here this afternoon in Hawaii and to be able to speak to you about aspects concerning the development of the Baha'i faith around the world. I was trying to think when the last time was that I was in Hawaii, and as far as I can tell, it was sometime during the 1980s, probably about 17 or 18 years ago. It's a very long time. I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to see the progress of the faith over the intervening period and to be able to meet with you. <coughs> the points I want to make with you this afternoon reduce to one very simple point, and it is this. It seems to me that the condition of the world today requires that we Baha'is make a drastic change in certain fundamental attitudes. And I say this because of the condition of the world and the direction in which it is going. As you know, the Guardian, in his various writings, including the unfoldment of world civilization, in the book World Order of Baha'u'llah, the Guardian refers to the age of transition in which we now find ourselves. Transition from the old world of division, of sectarianism and the like, to a new world promised categorically and definitely in our writings a world of unity and of an ever-advancing civilization. We are in transition. The transition is turbulent. The transition, the Guardian tells us, involves the simultaneous operation of two processes. A process of decline, which is all around us, and a process of growth, with which we are associated and which is gradually but very positively growing in scope, magnitude and influence. At the moment, the declining process is pervasive and influences us all consciously or unconsciously. It affects us in ways we may not readily perceive. As a consequence, we find ourselves caught up in the perverted standards of the declining process in which the abnormal becomes accepted as normal. We see around us the declining process producing alienation, extremism, self-destructive actions, a lack of purpose, people feeling disturbed, unsettled, the increase in suicide among youth, the development of addiction to self-destructive behaviours, the spread of immorality and the like. So my point is simple. What we need to do as a matter of survival is to change certain attitudes which are accepted as normal in the society around us and which are taken for granted by the mass of the people. We need to swim upstream to go in the opposite direction in certain fundamental attitudes, not as a luxury, not as a pleasant endeavour, but as a matter of survival. And if we do not, we will, and we see around us, people are being swept away 
by the destructive forces of the declining process. Beyond that, the changes in attitude, which I will go into in some greater detail presently, these changes in attitude will, more than anything else, attract to the Baha'i faith those who are searching, those who are yearning for a better world, for a more meaningful way of life, those who seek tranquility, contentment, peace of mind, and abiding happiness. The choice is with us. We have the power, the freedom, the right, but beyond that, the obligation to choose whether we will relax into the attitudes of the world around us or whether we will gird our loins, make an effort and struggle to acquire and manifest these new attitudes which are necessary for survival during this age of transition, during this period when the declining process is so strongly pervasive around us. Any attempt to change our attitudes is doomed to failure if it rests only on a strong desire, on an emotional commitment to make such a change. These are wonderful things. A strong desire to change. What can be wrong with that? An emotional commitment to change one's attitudes. How could one object to that? All I'm saying is that they are inadequate. They will result in an effort to change one's attitude which will last no more than a few days or weeks at most. A, an enduring endeavor to change one's attitudes to conform to the needs of the new age which we are struggling to build, an enduring commitment to effect that change will only succeed if it rests upon the Baha'i approach to spiritual development. So I want to take a few minutes to sketch very briefly, more as a reminder than anything else, the Baha'i approach, as I understand it, to spiritual development, and then I will proceed to go in greater detail into what I see to be three major changes of attitude needed. So, first, let me review some points of which you may well indeed be very familiar concerning the Baha'i approach, as I understand it, to spiritual development. My understanding is that this Baha'i approach to spiritual development rests upon four elements. The first of those is the recognition that there is a vast and mysterious force in the world which we call the power of the Holy Spirit, which is pervasive, which is all around us, which has been intensified with the coming of the Bab and Baha'u'llah and the revelations they brought, and which is accessible to us. 
a mysterious force which reinforces our own endeavours, which transforms us, which gives energy, motivation, drive and purpose to our endeavours. The second point is the approach set out in the Baha'i writings to attracting the power of the Holy Spirit. And this approach is described in many places by Baha'u'llah, by Abdul Baha, and by the Guardian using a remarkably simple example. And the simple example used by these various heads of the faith is that of the magnet. For example, Abdul Baha says, faith is the magnet which draws the confirmation of the merciful one. Service is the magnet which attracts the heavenly strength. And again, Abdul Baha states, the commemoration of God attracts confirmation and assistance like unto a magnet. In another place he says, unity and harmony is the magnet that draweth down the confirmations of God. And so on. He says elsewhere, directing mankind in the right path is the magnet which will attract to us the help of God. The various heads of the faith, our central figures and Shoghi Effendi, use the simple analogy of the magnet to describe a profound spiritual truth, that of an individual striving in the right way according to the prescriptions set out in our teachings. And that act of striving attracts this great power of the Holy Spirit, which transforms him or her, gives additional strength to accomplish one's objectives. So, we have as spiritual principles underlying a Baha'i approach to spiritual development, belief in this vast, mysterious and all-pervasive power of the Holy Spirit, and belief in the magnetic principle enunciated in our writings to the effect that if we strive along a prescribed way, we attract the power of the Holy Spirit. The third of the four elements of spiritual development is illustrated in our writings in the references to the interaction between effort and accomplishment. It is basically a po of a positive form. We're told that if we make an effort, we will attract a measure of the Holy Spirit and this will yield, as we apply it, this will yield to a measure of accomplishment. That in turn will reinforce our ability to make a greater effort which will attract a greater measure of the power of the Holy Spirit and lead to an even greater measure of accomplishment. And so it goes on. The Guardian describes it in one place as a process of rhythmic pulsations. The positive relationship between effort and accomplishment if only life 
were that simple. If only it was simply a matter of making an effort, accomplishment, greater effort, greater accomplishment, how easy it would be. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. The writings also tell us that part of the complexity of the interaction between effort and accomplishment lies in the fact that when we make an effort, we are subject to tests. That this simple picture of effort being reinforced by accomplishment ad infinitum is perturbed by the fact that tests come to us. We are tested when we make an effort. We are tested in the, the commitment we have to that effort, in our sincerity of effort, in our ability to persevere. The tests come to us in subtle ways. It may be public opinion. It may be the criticism of our peers and associates who ridicule us for what we are doing in making this effort. It may be an apparent lack of result. One makes an effort in a process of spiritual development and you work at it for weeks or months and you still seem to be the same old person. You give up. You say, this is a waste of time. It hasn't done me any good. It's a test. The test may be no more than boredom. We decide I'm going to read two or three pages of gleanings every night. And you read it. Next night you read it. Next night you read it and so on. But you reach a point where you'd rather be watching television or rather be out doing something more exciting. This is a test, a test of boredom. One, of course, is never uh, sufficiently willing to admit to oneself that one is bored by the sacred writings, but it's something that happens. There are tests. The process of interaction between effort and accomplishment includes testing, and one has to recognize that for that process to yield greater accomplishment and in turn greater effort and even further accomplishment. Yet that is central to the process of spiritual development. And it is for this reason that Abdul Baha is reported to have said in Wilmette in 1912, when he laid the cornerstone for the Baha'i House of Worship in Wilmette, completed that process, he stood and he said, reportedly, the temple is already built. He knew decades of very hard work lay ahead for Baha'i Temple Unity and later for the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States and Canada. At that time, he knew the sacrifices, the effort, the heartache, the setbacks, the struggles which must ensue before the temple would be constructed, but aware of the interaction between effort and accomplishment from small efforts, ultimately through perseverance come great accomplishments, Abdul Baha said, the temple is already built. And it is in that, in many ways, encapsulates the essence of the process of spiritual development. The final point about the process of spiritual development is that intrinsic to it, in the Baha'i writings, is the concept of periodic assessment. That it's necessary to take stock, to reflect, to reassess on a periodic basis. 
We have the statements in our writings which enjoin us to bring ourselves to account each day. We have the periodicity of Baha'i community practice, the 19-day feast, the period of the fast for one Baha'i month every year, the coming of Baha'i holy days at various intervals throughout the year. Our lives as Baha'is are subject to a degree of periodicity which enables us beyond the daily assessment to reflect and to assess and make whatever adjustments are necessary to our spiritual development. Well, this is only intended to be a brief survey of that subject. It's not really the subject I want to talk about, but I did want to to briefly touch upon it to illustrate my view that the changes of attitude of which I will now speak depend fundamentally upon a commitment to the process of spiritual development which I believe rests upon these points of the pervasiveness of the power of the Holy Spirit, the magnetic principle, the interaction of effort and accomplishment, and the need for periodic assessment. Let me now leave that and go more centrally to my subject, which is our the required changes of attitude that are necessary for us to survive in this period of transition where the declining process is so strong. Now, there are three elements where I feel changes of attitude are very important to us. The first of these is in our attitude to the world. I believe we should become distinguished by a significant change in attitude towards the world. And let me tell you what I mean by this. We need to become distinguished by our pervasive and abiding confidence in the future. I say this because I think things have changed not only since 9-11 or since the war in Afghanistan or the invasion in Iraq or the rise of the Al-Qaeda and its association with terrorism in various parts of the world, but beyond that. I believe we have entered a condition where the increasing mass of the people of the world are losing or have lost confidence in the future. Until recent years, it is my view that people thought generally we'll muddle through. Somehow we'll make it. This is not such a great year, but next year will be better. This particular problem will will be resolved if we just wait it out. Things will improve. And I think that confidence in the future is rapidly being eradicated. On news interviews, magazine articles, things I read and see and hear about, more and more, to my mind, they indicate the loss of confidence that a better world is coming. There is, to my mind, a rise of a deep fear that the civilization in which we participate is doomed, that it is collapsing around us, that vast problems are appearing on the horizon, be they problems of the disintegration of society, be they problems of terrorism, the spread of pestilences, nuclear proliferation, clashes of civilization and the like. I believe the mass of the people of the world have entered a period of a sharp 
loss of confidence. And for that reason, I think it is essential that we not get caught up in those attitudes, but that we manifest and express fully our total conviction that a good world is coming. Why are we so convinced of that? Not because of any great wisdom or insight on our part, but simply because the founder of our religion tells us that. Baha'u'llah tells us categorically, explicitly, and in great detail that we are going through an age of transition, that humanity will come through it, that there is no doubt, there is no uncertainty. The writings do not minimize the difficulties, the challenges, the ordeals that sections of humanity may well experience in the years to come, but the writings make it clear beyond any possible doubt that a good world is coming, that world unity will be achieved, that world civilization will be constructed, that what is expressed in Christian expectation as the coming of the kingdom of God on earth will occur and that humanity, world civilization will evolve hundreds and indeed thousands of years into the future in the Baha'i cycle. We need to internalize this. We need to get it as part of our automatic thinking. So it shines in our eyes. It's clear from our conduct, from our approach to our daily lives that we really believe this. This will be apparent in the fact that we plan for the future, that we're building for a better world, that we're taking those personal actions that are associated with somebody who has confidence in the future. He or she tends to make plans for their education, for the acquisition of skills in the arts and crafts, to plans for what they're going to do over the longer term course of their lives because they know there is a better world coming and they're working towards it. If we do this, we will not only survive the depression, the gloom, the pessimism, which I think are increasingly invading all sections of society, but we will act as a shining example of what the world can see in us and which will give it hope and courage to face the future. <coughs> in so doing, we will encounter a certain degree of hazard. People will say to us, why are you so confident of the future? Why have you such a sense of assurance? How will it come about? Generally, people who are positive and optimistic are so because they don't really know what's going on. People who are happy and content, one tends to want to deflate their balloon by telling them that what really the world is, is occurring. We are confident in the future because we know what really is going on. And what really is going on is that the rules have changed. All the rules have been changed by the coming of a manifestation of God, 
bringing this great source of spiritual power and changing the conditions of the world in a very fundamental and a very mysterious way. As the writings say, the world's equilibrium has been upset. When we are questioned about our confidence, we can point to our teachings, to the spread of these teachings and their increasing influence in society. People will say to us, ah, but history shows good ideals have been doomed to failure and the record of history is replete with such examples. Why is it that you are confident of the future? Our answer is this, that we have a unique delivery system designed to translate high ideals into practical reality. And that unique delivery system is what we now call the Baha'i administrative order. It is not simply the way in which we organize ourselves and conduct meetings and decide who's going to be a member of which body and the like. It is far more than that. It is a vehicle for our collective unified actions. It is a means for avoiding evil doers destroying commitment to high ideals and it is a way of training us in the behaviours needed to bring about a new world. The other aspect of course of our confidence in the future lies in the fact that our teachings and of course the messages that come to us from the world centre of the faith periodically are all designed to give us what I would call a process orientation. The whole tenor of the faith from its earliest days onwards is one of process rather than event orientation, the recognition that things change and develop in an organic manner. When the first Baha'i went to, say, a continent like South America, Shoghi Effendi designated her as the spiritual conqueror of South America. What do you mean, spiritual conqueror? Nobody heard of her. She came and went. She died without anybody noticing more than in a very minor transient way. And then she was gone. And the place looked basically similar. Decades later, it looked slightly different. Why are we talking and naming this lady, in the case of South America, Leonora Armstrong Holzapple, why are we naming her spiritual conqueror of South America? Because our faith is focused on processes. The going of the first pioneer to a continent such as South America initiated a process which would ultimately lead to the entire spiritualization of the whole of South America. And it was this process orientation that Shoghi Effendi gave her that designation. That is increasingly becoming the way in which Baha'is are being trained to think about their present day activities and about the future. And that also feeds in to our confidence in the future. Confidence based principally on the unequivocal promises of Baha'u'llah reinforced by the existence of an administrative order designed to be the delivery system to bring it into being and by our recognition 
that great and fundamental changes occur in a process sense, organically, rather than through the manner of a few dramatic events. That's one of the three attitudinal changes that I think we need to incorporate in our lives. <clears throat> the second of the three is my view that we, and by we I mean in generally, you may already have already absorbed all this and may not apply to you individually, but in general I think we need to change our attitude to the process of change. In other words, we need to, to make a modification to how we look at change. Change is the perennial problem of any religion. If you look at the present day as well as at history, religions are generally afraid of change for good reason. It disturbs the equilibrium. It has an unsettling effect on people. It opens the way to disagreement and division. Any religion which decides it'll make a change, whether it's, for example, with the Roman Catholic uh, abolition of Latin for the mass or certain rituals and certain requirements, these kinds of things and similar changes in other religions open the way for disagreement and division and also open the way to extremism. You find that there are extremists who want the change to be accelerated vastly and quickly and other extremists who resist desperately and want to cling to the old ways. So generally a religion as a phenomenon in our society, religion is largely resistant and always suspicious of change. By contrast, our religion is committed to change. It is a religion that embraces change far more pervasively than any other religion of past dispensations. There is a passage of Abdul Baha which I quote, he says, change is a necessary quality and an essential attribute of this world and of time and place. And this is an astonishing statement from an authoritative figure in a world religion. Far more than reluctant acceptance of change, far beyond that is the remark of Abdu'l-Bahá that change is a necessary quality and an essential attribute of this world. We are a religion which as far as I can tell from my reading, my study and what I hear and what people tell me, we represent a religion which has embraced change to an extent without parallel in any religious dispensation in recorded history. And this commitment to change is exemplified in the existence of the universal house of justice as head of the faith because the universal house of justice is a body empowered by Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha to bring about change. In the specification of the prerogatives of the house of justice, it is clearly stated that it has the power to change, as it deems fit of course, those things that are not explicitly recorded in the writings and then to change its own decision later as circumstances change. What that means 
is that we are part of a religion which can and will continue to give expression to creativity, to development, to innovation as the civilization grows and develops. This is wonderful. But what it means is that we as Baha'is are subject to test when change occurs. Let me give you some, a simple example. During the time until 1963, the practice which had been followed by Shoghi Effendi because of the conditions, the social conditions in the Middle East was that Eastern and Western pilgrims were segregated. They went at separate times to the shrines. They essentially had dual tracks, separate uh, procedures for the pilgrimage. The Universal House of Justice, when it came into being in 1963, soon thereafter decided that it was appropriate to change that. And now Eastern and Western pilgrims mix together as one group. Forty odd years have passed and we take it for granted. It was not so at the time. There were a number of people who were rather shocked, who were somewhat horrified that the House of Justice had made that change. It was something Shoghi Effendi had done and lo and behold, the House of Justice had come along and changed it. It was a test to a number of people. So change brings with it test. People tend to be comfortable with the old way. They tend to be somewhat inflexible and then they're tested by the fact that something they were very comfortable with, which they thought was rock solid, is being changed. On the other hand, there are those who want change and regard us as being very impervious or deaf or stubborn or something because we won't change. There are people who appeal to the Universal House of Justice to change the restriction specified by Baha'u'llah rather not worry it, so, but I think that's the kind of thing that happens as part of the application of Baha'i uh, laws through the institutions. Uh, any other? No, I've only that. You've had your question. Thanks very much. Anybody else want another question? Because I'm not going to get drawn into this. I've been around long enough. Yes. <laughs> yes. Vermel, right? Vernice. Vernice. I knew it was something. Vernice was a person who used to be a source of torment to me when she. <laughs> Lived in Milwaukee, yeah. <laughs> in answer to Vanessa's question, I uh, recall when I was an auxiliary board member, I was a protection board member for a while, and there was some problem in a place which I feel I can mention without sort of uh, backbiting against the individuals. The place was called Carson City, Nevada. And so the councillors consulted with the National Assembly and decided to send me out there from Michigan. I went out to Carson City, Nevada and dealt with the, the situation and that was that. As I was preparing to go for this weekend flight across to, to uh, Reno, I guess, then down to Carson City, I happened to be in personal conversation with the Secretary of the National Spiritual Assembly, who in those days was Glenford Mitchell. And Glenford said to me, you know, while you're out there in Carson City, uh, although that's not the central point of your mission, try and find out what's happening with the local assembly. I said, what do you mean? He said, we regard that as one of the ten best local assemblies in the United States. So I was very interested in that. So I went out to Carson City, uh, Nevada, and did what I was, had to do with a little problem. And then because I was a visiting auxiliary board member, they felt the LSA felt they should meet with me as a courtesy, and so they did. And they said to we talked, and I said to them, you know, I got news for you. 
uh, Mr. Mitchell, the Secretary of the National Assembly, said you were one of the ten best local assemblies in the US. Tell me what you do. And they all looked at each other blankly and said, we don't know what you're talking about. So I explained it once more and they said, you know, we're all fairly new Baha'is in Carson City, Nevada, which they were. They were Baha'is for no more than maybe two or three years at most. So they said, we don't know anything. So what we do, whenever a matter comes up, we have a whole pile of books there and we look and see what the, what the writings say and we do that. I said, don't change anything. <laughs> so the answer to Vanessa's question, which is a very well-posed question, it is simply the fact that we want the local spiritual assemblies to follow the prescriptions set out in the teachings. It doesn't mean they have to become hard-hearted it doesn't mean they should lack insight into the complexity of human nature and into the weakness that all human beings can have, but it does mean that we need to apply the law to protect the reputation of the Baha'i community, to protect its integrity by the fact that we respect the law and that we do not tolerate flagrant deviations from Baha'i law in our local communities. In other words, it's so easy not to stir the whole mess up and just look the other way, and that way the faith is, suffers. We need to, to, the assembly needs to focus on the issues if it's something that where there's uh, Baha'i law is being uh, violated in a flagrant manner and take action. Obviously, we have to avoid the other extreme. We don't need private detectives go around snooping and uh, looking to see what's happening. But we do need people who uh, uh, are aware of their responsibility for the service to the faith. It doesn't mean we have to misjudge people, but it does mean we have to be concerned for the welfare of the faith more than the welfare of the individual. I'm reminded of a story which involves my friend Ben Ayala, who's somewhere here around the place. Ben and I used to be counsellors in the old days, and uh, the counsellors would meet in our home in Brisbane. I can hardly tell the story. I mean, I'm enjoying it so much. And, uh, and we would, they'd gather in Brisbane, where Jan and I were living, and the councillors would meet and they'd, in our home and uh, we'd prepare the meals and everything would go fine. This is a very straightforward thing. The problem was both Janet and I were teaching at the University of Queensland and uh, we would entertain our academic friends as part of a tortuous process of making friends for the faith. And if you've ever been involved in that kind of situation, you'll know that the mores is if you're invited to somebody's home like that, you turn up not empty-handed. And usually it was a bottle of wine, sometimes a bottle of champagne, sometimes a bottle of some other alcoholic drink. We chose not to serve it, although there's flexibility in the teachings on that. So do we chose not to serve it, we would accept it very graciously from the person offering to us. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. We'd stick it in the refrigerator and then the next day or two days later, very discreetly return it to them at the university and say, thank you very much, but as you know, we don't drink and it's a very generous gift and so on and so forth. That was the theory. The practice was that after the, the dinner was over, we were so tired, we'd forget to return the thing, and it'd end up in the back of the refrigerator. And any of you who have a refrigerator in your home know that there are all kinds of weird things in the back of the refrigerator. <laughs> and uh, so the bottle of wine would be there, and usually it was just before a councillor's meeting. And it's a source of uh, 
gratification to me that the councillors would be helping in the kitchen, including Ben and Sohela Lai and all kinds of other people, and they would see this thing there and they never commented on it. They never said, hey, you, you're a councillor, what are you doing with a bottle of wine in the refrigerator and what's this do? They just, they, and I'm sure they notice a bottle of wine in a refrigerator, you can't help but notice it even if it's the back. And, but they, and I always, I later felt that that was a measure of the balance in the faith. One doesn't shrink from dealing with problems, but one doesn't become the private detective and go around peering into people's private affairs and deciding about them. What spoiled my story, and of course, and I really still hold this against Ben, wherever he is, uh, here, and that was that Collis Featherstone came and met with us, and these so-called friends of mine, including Mr Ayala, made sure the bottle of wine was in the middle of the table when Collis <laughs> came to meet with us. Yeah. I'll take one more question and then we'll stop. Yes, yeah, this is a question concerning how does the House of Justice handle a situation where it feels that change is required which conflicts with the scriptures. I have n never encountered such a situation. I have encountered situations where we feel that on the basis of the scriptures it's difficult for us to see how something should occur but that's always due to deficiency of insight of the individual and not to a deficiency of the scriptures. And that's the way it should be because the scriptures, the authoritative texts of the faith are immutable until the coming of the next manifestation. So if Baha'u'llah has said that this is to be, then it's to be until the next manifestation comes. So if I read something where Baha'u'llah says this is to be and I say, boy, oh boy, I can't see how that can work in this particular circumstances. I know it's because of deficiency of my understanding. And so I use it as a spur to my deeper understanding. There are, of course, situations where the writings contain statements, particularly statements by the Guardian, where he says, for the present... And those are subject to change by the House of Justice. And if ever you want to carry out an interesting little mental exercise, try looking through the writings of the Guardian which refer to the process of assembly formation. And you'll be stunned at how many things are for the present. The whole electoral procedure whether there's to be nine on an assembly or more than nine, how often the election is to occur, should it be every year or every several years, and all kinds of things we have taken for granted, you find on close inspection, are, have a temporary authority as clearly specified by the Guardian, and he says in all instances this is subject to change by the House of Justice. So it is conceivable that at some point in the dispensation the House of Justice will change some law, some what appears to be a law about how many should serve on a local or a national assembly, and then people will say, well, they're changing the text. No, they're not. Go back and see what it says in the Kadabi Actus and in other places. It's simply applying the latitude. But the central thing I want to say is when there seems to be a apparent something in the authoritative text which seems to conflict with what I understand to be reality, it's because my understanding of reality is inadequate and of course as we all know the individual members of the Universal House of Justice are not authoritative they have all kinds of weaknesses and deficiencies and the like it is an authoritative body which we attach importance to okay let me stop I'll take my water with me thank you very much